guys. So hello, welcome, happy Friday, happy Black History Month. And I'm glad that you could join us for the first Innovate of 2023. And today we have Dr. Brian Ramson, and he is representing from Fermilab, which is a really awesome place if you haven't gone to visit yet. And he will be talking about a review of the physics program. Um, just give me one second, I lost my uh, oh, Sorry, my computer is currently not working too well. One second. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Um, I don't know why my computer is freezing. But anyway, so thank you, Dr. Ramson, for joining us today. A little bit about Dr. Ramson. He's a neutrino physicist. He's working on the intensity frontier of high energy particle physics. And he works as an associate scientist at Fermilab using his expertise in medium and high energy physics, nuclear physics, to improve measurements of neutrino oscillations and refine our understanding of neutrino nucleus interactions. He's a member of two large experimental collaborations, which are the Fermilab NUMI off axis the appearance experiment, or let's just call it NOVA, and the upcoming deep underground neutrino experiment, DUNE, which some of you may have heard of. I have also heard of them before. Uh, he is, um, he earned his dual bachelor's in physics and math and master's in atmospheric science from Howard University, represent in Washington, D.C. And he also earned another master's and Ph.D. in applied physics from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. He is a strong, he has a strong commitment to serving society scientifically and socially. And before matriculating at Michigan, he was a visiting scholar at Earth Sciences Division of NASA Goddard from Howard University, where he worked primarily on the measurement of cloud properties in the Baltimore-Washington corridor and the U.S. Southern Great Plains region. He's currently serving as the co-chair of the Fermilab Saturday Morning Physics Program and has engaged in various forms of community engagement around the Chicago land area especially as it concerns out science outreach and local community organizing. Dr. Ramson is a native of New Orleans, Louisiana, um, coming of age in the seventh and ninth ward. And he currently resides in West Garfield Park neighborhood of West side of Chicago, Illinois. When he's not thinking about quarks or leptons or actively working for a better future, he enjoys popular television and movies, speculative fiction, ooh, okay, exercise, performance driving, and video games. And with that, I would like to warmly welcome Dr. Ramson as our speaker for this Innovate. Hey, y'all. Thanks for joining. I really appreciate it. So we've got a pretty cozy group. Uh, I know some of you. Um, so I think the usual format is that we um, we typically do a, the talk and then do an answer or question and answer. So as part of Saturday morning physics, where we talk to a bunch of high schoolers about physics, what I find is that generally it's good to encourage enthusiasm. So I would encourage you to speak up if you can or put a question in the Q&A if you can, if you want it answered, and we can talk about it while um, the topic is fresh. Um, I like to have conversations about physics, so talks are great and they're fun. I like to give those too, but I really value feedback from the audience. So if you want to say something, yeah, let's do it. So anyway, so we're going to talk about um, this project that I'm working on, and it is the resurrection of the idea of bubble chambers for, for modern particle physics. So this is a fairly interesting idea, so let's get into it. <clears throat> Okay, so we start at the beginning like we start with everything else, with the standard model. This is a theory of almost everything. I consider it the crown jewel of particle physics. You'll be hearing my opinion a lot in this talk. And what I find so interesting about the standard model of particle physics is that the relationships and things that it describes are simple enough to be written in the single Lagrangian that can fit on a coffee cup. So they describe all the matter and all the force interactions as well as the generation of at least initial mass through the Higgs boson. 
And the critical thing I want to stress here is that doing particle physics means testing the standard model. So one of the ways uh -oh, in which I test the standard model, my primary way, is through particle scattering. So essentially what you can do is shoot things at other things and watch them either bounce away or blow up. And the way in which they bounce, the way in which they're shot at the, the, the target, we can sort of parameterize with this thing called an impact parameter. And we can sort of parameterize uh, what's happening using, at least in this picture, some sort of angular distribution. And what this essentially means is that we are calculating what's known as a cross section and this cross section you can think of as a as a, a way of encoding information about what you're what you're scattering off of. And you can also think of it as like a probability of scattering as well. And the reason I wanted to include this picture is so that you can see that just by varying one thing in your initial scattering particle. Uh, so again, the impact parameter, this D parameter, you can sort of encode what's inside of what you're scattering, or at least the details of what you're scattering against in this theta region or in this variable theta. And you can replace that variable theta with anything. So you can take a cross-section with respect to energy. You can take a cross-section with respect to momentum, right? So these are ways in which we get to the math that we think about. So that Lagrangian gives you an amplitude, and that amplitude, again, goes to a cross-section. So this is the primary way, one of the primary ways the, the field of science does it, but it's also how I do it. So now we come to one of the interesting things I find about the field. I call it a conundrum. It's not like an official thing. It's, this is mostly just my opinion. There is a division between nuclear physics and high-energy particle physics. And it's funny because particle physics sort of involves both. In fact, I would say that high energy physics, high energy particle physics grew out of nuclear physics. But the primary differences are, um, I think nuclear physics concerns, it, so there are a number of ways to do nuclear physics, and the energy scales are very broad. So you can go from EV, which is in a single electron volt, to GeV, which is about a billion electron volts. And the, the, the difference there is, a, is nine orders of magnitude, right? And the critical thing about nuclear physics is that you're using the electroweak scattering process to learn about the nuclei of atoms and also to understand the nuclear medium. So what that means is that you're using a very simple process that you understand very well, such as deep and elastic scattering, which is you literally shooting an electron or a lepton at uh, a hadron or baryon so, 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 uh, with so much energy that it explodes. But as it explodes, it interacts with an individual quark. You can also turn that, that Feynman diagram, which I'm talking about with deep and elastic scattering, you can rotate it because this is also topologically equivalent to a, pro to a process called draw yaw which is when two um, quarks also self-interact, annihilate, and produce two leptons. So these are two of the primary scattering processes that we use in nuclear physics. There's also E plus E minus annihilation. Um, I didn't show that here because it's not a really fancy diagram, but the idea is that these processes are very simple and well understood, and it allows us to understand something very complicated. Now, if we move into high energy physics, we see that there that we we're primarily concerned with the electroweak sector of the standard model, and this would be at energies well above one GeV. So the the primary thing that I think about when I think of high energy particle physics is the LAC, and what you have on the bottom right is a um, it's a map of all the cross sections of which you would encounter in a collider experiment when the TeV was operating at a 7 TeV uh, center mass energy. Uh, I lost my mouse, but one of the things I want you to look at is that if you look at the red um, plot, you see, see this GG to H. And what this is telling you is that the primary way that you're getting a Higgs is from the fusion of gluons, which is not something that you really want to deal with mathematically. It can be calculated exactly, but it's, it's fairly difficult. So what the, the thing I want to get across about HEP or about high energy physics is that we more or less, we try to do the best we can with the, comp with the, 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 the complication of the math that we're working with, but we're really interested in probing physics, testing the standard model, and trying to figure out um, if we can find paths to beyond standard model physics. The reasoning here between these two, the, the reason that there are, that there's such a, a division between these two fields is because QCD, which is the, the Lagrangian or the standard model part that describes what's happening inside of nuclear physics or inside of nuclei, is extremely difficult. 
And the way I can illustrate that is by comparing that to electromagnetism, right? So if you look at these Lagrangians up here, it's, it all looks super complicated. It's not. Uh, what you have is this psi, um, the psi bar and psi R, what you can think of as the matter fields. These would be the quarks. And then you have these G, this, this contraction of this, this G uh, variable. That's the, the field strength parameter. And what this, this is, you can think of basically as an electric field or, or an electromagnetic field. And that's dependent upon some color or potentials, which you see defined in the bottom. Now, the critical difference between um, QCD and ENM is that there's this additional structure function that's dependent upon some complicated math, which we're not going to get into, which basically says that gluons self-interact. If you think about the force carrier particle for ENM, which is the photon, it does not self-interact. The other thing you have is uh, the structure, this, this structure in this covariant gauge derivative, which more or less tells you that when you are coupling your gluon field to your quark field, you have this really complicated structure you need to deal with, and that's your color charge. So what all this complicated and, and, and esoteric uh, verbiage means is that as you move farther away from the EM field, the field gets weaker. But with color fields, with in, in nuclear physics, the field behaves in a completely different manner. As you move away from a color charged object, it gets stronger because gluons can be created um, as they interact with, with, with each other. They basically bounce off each other. And this gives you confinement. And that's one of the reasons HEP doesn't really like to do low energy things is because then you have to deal with confinement. But nuclear physics is primarily concerned with finding ways to get around confinement, even at lower bound state energies. And we have all sorts of methods for doing that. So now enter the neutrino. This is the thing I work on. And I call this the ghostly elementary particle because the neutrino does not interact with anything. Well, it does, but it's, it's a very low cross section. And the reasoning here is that the neutrinos, they, do, they are uh, electromagnetically neutral, which means they do not feel the EM force. Um, and they're also color neutral, which means they don't feel the color force. The only thing that they, the only way they interact is through W and Z bosons. And what this means is you can go through like six, six light years of lead before a neutrino will interact with anything. So what I've pointed here, what I've put over here is a, a cross section uh, for neutrinos that we've measured for deuterium. So this is a neutrino hitting a deuterium atom and then bouncing off or doing something. And these are all the measurements we've done over the past, I don't know, 40 to 50 years from a bunch of different bubble chamber experiments, as well as modern um, accelerator neutrino experiments. And what I want you to pay attention to about this graph is not necessarily the shape, but the axis, the y-axis. That cross-section is 10 to the negative 38 centimeters squared. So that is, I think, about a 10 to the negative four, or a 14 order of magnitude difference from electron scattering. So they are very difficult to measure, but I call them a Blade Runner because they are one of the few particles that we can use that will that'll say a lot about nuclear physics and also a lot about high energy physics. And what I'm trying to do with my project is sort of do some things that are important for high energy physics, but also backdoor Fermilab into doing nuclear physics because I find both very interesting. So let's talk about some of the things we can do with uh, some of the ways neutrinos can contribute to the the standard model physics. Um, before we get started in, on this, do we have any questions? I can't see the chat. Anybody want to speak up? Anything you didn't understand? I'm going to take that as a, I'm going to give it 15 more seconds and say that's a no. All right, awesome. So now we get into the, to how we can use neutrinos for beyond the standard model physics. And again, I like to start with Lagrangians because that's where all the math is. So what you're looking at up top is the charge current Lagrangian for neutrinos. So what you're looking at is a W boson, that's the W minus, interacting with a lepton, that's that L, and then you have a neutrino, which is this new underscore alpha uppercase L. And what this part of the Lagrangian is telling you is that at, as you interact with a neutrino that has a particular flavor, you're interacting with a neutrino that's actually in a superposition of mass states. So the neutrino flavor and mass states are different. And what this means is that as neutrinos travel through space and time, they 
undergo what is inherently a quantum mechanical effect, and they oscillate in flavor because the mass states are beating against each other. And what this means is that if you put a detector at the right spot from the source of neutrinos, you can literally observe a neutrino that is emitted in one flavor become another. So we can describe this with a with a with a single I'm going to say matrix, but in the case of a two neutrino approximation, it's just a, I think a, 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 a it would be a scalar matrix, which is just a single value. No, no, it'd be a 2D matrix. Um, so in a two neutrino approximation, you have a, a just an electron neutrino and a muon neutrino, and again, these flavor states have different. Um, are superpositions of mass states. So if you want to reflect things as mass states to get the rotational basis between, uh, to get the rotation between these two bases, you can just represent that as a single Euler angle. So what you can think of that as, uh, pinning that to simpler math, is it's just a rotation of a 2D axis. So think of it like polar coordinates. And you only need one Euler angle to describe um, the the places in which you could place your detector that would allow you to observe oscillation. So this is a simplified model, but as we move into what's actually what, at least the minimum uh, number of things you need to describe what's happening in reality, we know there are three neutrinos. You get a three by three matrix um, because you have to describe a rotation instead of in two dimensions. You have to describe it in three dimensions. And turns out you can take that that matrix, which we call the PMNS matrix. You can decompose it into um, matrices that are dependent upon a, a single source, so atmospheric, reactor, or solar. Accelerator is somewhere between atmospheric and reactor. And then you can basically try to measure these, these Euler angles. And if you measure the Euler angles to the correct precision, you get access to a fourth parameter called delta CP, which literally gives you some way of thinking about um, why matter exists over antimatter at the beginning of the Big Bang, right? The fact that we're all here means that we weren't annihilated during uh, the Big Bang or some fraction of a second after the Big Bang. And that's because there was an asymmetry there. There had to be more matter than antimatter, and we don't know why. And we believe this might be a path to figuring out why. One of the other things you can do is look at some relation of the hidden, mass, the hidden neutrino mass states to each other. There are some theories that say that the third neutrino mass state, which you would most closely associate with the heaviest neutrino, or what you assume is the heaviest neutrino, might be lighter than the other two. We're not sure. There's some ambiguity, so we can resolve that by measuring the parameters in this matrix. Okay, we got a question, or we got something in the chat. What does PMNS matrix stand for? So PMNS is, it's like a group of four theorists, it's like Quanta Corvo, I can't remember their names, but it's a it's a few Japanese physicists and I think an Italian guy. They basically all derive this at the same time. And literally what it describes is the translation between the flavor states of the neutrino and the mass states of the, of the neutrino. There are at least three flavors of neutrinos and there are corresponding mass states, but the flavor states are actually superpositions of the mass states. I hope that makes sense, Alan. All right. So I need to kill this chat right quick so I can see my slides in a sec. Okay. So now we move into the current city of the art detectors and the measurements that they're doing. So we have two different city of the art experiments. I'm on one called Nova. It's based at Fermi Lab. It's a, tool, it's a dual detector design, and we basically shoot neutrinos through the earth through a detector at Fermi Lab, and then a detector that's in Ash River, Minnesota. We also have a competitor called TDK, which is operating in Japan, and they do a similar thing. It's just at a lower energy, and the detectors are different. Our detectors, we use the same solid detector for both the one at Fermi Lab and at Ash River. Excuse me. In uh, Japan, TDK uses two different styles of detectors to do that. It makes the experiment somewhat more difficult, but it's also very interesting. So what you're looking at on the right is a, a comparison. So this is like state of the art. We 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 release this measurement at uh, Neutrino, which is the big like uh, Neutrino conference that we all go to from all over the world. So these are like the cutting edge results. And what these results essentially say that if if you your measurement for sine squared theta two three, which is one of those Euler angles, and delta CP, Nova has a value which is close to pi. 
and delta, uh, not delta, T decay has a value that is close to 3 pi over 2. These values are contradictory, but the uncertainties are so large on these measurements um, that they, the central values might disagree, but the actual measurements don't disagree. It's possible that the, the statistical uncertainty or the, the ability to, to resolve the actual value is so low in both experiments that they don't really disagree with each other yet. And this is because these experiments are statistically limited. So if we go to why the uncertainties are so large, again, the major problem, or well, not problem, the major thing about these experiments is that they're both statistically limited, which means we need more time to collect data to do a much better measurement. But the second order effects, the systematic uncertainties on these experiments, the primary uncertainty comes from neutrino cross-sections. It turns out that we don't know enough about cross-sections to do the most precise measurement possible. And there are ways to get around this, but it's difficult. And even if we tried to, we still wouldn't know if we had the right answer. It turns out, the, again, the primary, uh, besides detector calibration, which has to do with how well we understand our detector, the primary thing that we worry about are neutrino cross-sections. And this is both on TDK and NOVA. So let's talk about the, the neutrino nucleus cross-section problem. So this on the left is a plot of uh, neutrino cross-sections as a function of energy. And what we're seeing is that the NOVA and DUNE experiments, DUNE is one of the other ones I'm working on, which we're going to talk about in a bit, operate in a very complicated cross-sectional region. So the initial scattering of the neutrino from the nucleus or from the nucleon can happen in at least one of three ways. And then there's a fourth way that also happens if you have multiple um, nucleons or neutron, multiple neutrons and protons in the nucleus. And the energies of these experiments sit at the exact region or at the exact point where you have to navigate three of these different processes at once, minimum, and they all look like each other. Then there's another issue in that once you do the, the, the relatively easy part of figuring out which scattering which which scatter which scattering process you you actually saw you then have to deal with the remnants of the scattering process getting out of the nucleus so this then becomes a nuclear physics problem but in the experiments that we're running these two problems are convolved they cannot be separated with the current amount of data we have right now well, the question is why so one of the ways in which we try to disentangle those two um those two different problems in the cross sections and the understanding of neutrino cross sections is by looking at old bubble chamber data. So we go back and we look at bubble chambers from Brookhaven, Argonne, Bepsch, which is an experiment in Europe. It's the big European bubble chamber. And also Fermilab had a bubble chamber. We look at it as a function of neutrino energy and we look at cross sections for individual processes. So for example, on the bottom left or on the top left is a neutrino bouncing off a proton this is a charge current interaction. You're getting a muon and some hadron, which contains quarks, which means this is a neutrino uh, process that generates nuclear physics stuff. You get pions there. So any place you see a pion is a meson that's generated. What these data are telling you, though, is that if you look at the comparison of the Brookhaven and the Argonne National Laboratory bubble chambers, they disagree. The fact that the, that the data are not on top of each other means that they got fundamentally different answers for what the cross-section should be at that region. And that's the same region that Dune and Nova are operating at. And this happens across multiple processes. We also have problems with the flux. And then one of the critical problems, the flux was, would be the, the, the actual beam of neutrinos. We don't know that to a high precision. And then if you actually count the, the, the total amount of events that we're looking at, it's less than 10,000 events, or actually it's not less than, it's about it's about 12 to 15,000 events that we are using to constrain data on both Dune, on, on both Dune and Nova. Now, this won't be a problem on Nova because we're not going to have a ton of events. But as we move to Dune, which you'll see, we're going to have so many more orders, so many, yeah, so many more orders of magnitude of events that um, this data will not have the precision to actually ex figure out what's happening in Dune as far as scattering goes. So now let's talk about Dune. I just had a quick question. Yeah. So back to the previous slide, 
um, comparing the data? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, let me find it for you. Oh, boy. Where is it? It should be like right here. There we go. Yes, this one. Uh -huh. So as far as like old and new, uh, I can understand that. But comparing uh, different experiments or different mm -hmm. like devices, uh, what kind of factors goes into that? Because I know that everybody runs their experiment differently, right? And mm -hmm. they might even have, like, even down to the procedures and the engineering. So do you factor in those kinds of things when you're comparing data, or is it purely, like, the results? No, we do try to factor those in as best as we can. The process for converting experimental decisions of data or experimental measurements to what we, con what we consider to be unfolded or unsmeared data, which is more like ideal data, you can think of it, it's called unsmearing. It's the actual unfolding or unsmearing process. So what we do is we, we simulate the detector in Monte Carlo, and then we compare that simulation to the actual detector. And then we, 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 we basically perform experiments in the simulation, and we see what the how the detector responds to that. That gives you what's known as an unsmearing matrix, which we then use to convert the data that we measure to ideal data. That's that's the way of saying oh, it. Oh, so there's like a baseline for that you can yeah. use in simulation. That's yeah, and, cool. and one of the major problems we have with this bubble chamber data is, is that we don't understand the bubble chambers enough to actually do the unsmearing process. That's like another thing we have to worry about. Got you, thanks. Yep. All right, so heading back to Dune. So Dune is a the future long baseline oscillation experiment. I say the, it'll be the one in the US. It'll be very similar to NOVA. We'll have two detectors, but we're gonna be using a new technology called a liquid argon time projection chamber. Obviously, we're gonna look at PM and S matrix. We're gonna try to look for a CP violation, neutrino mass hierarchy. We're also gonna be looking, we're gonna have so many protons in one space. How you doing? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm in the middle of a talk. I've been here giving talks for like the past, I don't know, two or three days. This is the first time I've been told it's closed. We're, we're going to continue and see if he comes back or not. Um, so, uh, where was I? Oh, grand unified theories. So we're going to have so many nucleons in one space that we're going to, we're going to be able to, to say something about proton decay and actually uh, resolve the difference between grand unified theories, and we're also going to be able to say something about supernova burst neutrinos. So if things operate the way that we want them to operate, this will probably be the last generation of accelerator-driven long baseline neutrino experiments. Elon, could you read that chat, please? It's just a joke, don't worry. Okay. Um, I was wondering if the dinosaur fossils were um, part of the experimental design. This is actually an April Fool's joke, <laughs> but I like this one to make sure people are paying attention. Where the dinosaurs should be, should be neutrinos. But it's quite possible that we'll be uh, seeing <laughs> I like it. It's quite possible we'll be sending neutrinos through dinosaurs. It's possible. So that's, that, that, that South Dakota range actually is where we found some like old skeletons of dinosaurs, fossils and stuff. So it's possible. Anyway. Um, so it's, it's likely this will be the last generation of acceler accelerator-driven long baseline experiments. Um, the the sensitivity of this experiment is going to be, we're expecting to get things on the order of 1%, and that means we will be able to resolve the mass ordering, so this inverted to, to, to uh, normal hierarchy of the mass um, of neutrinos, we're going to be able to resolve that so within five sigma of, uh, after two years of stage data taking. We're going to be able to look at CP violations, so delta CP at certain values. We're going to be able to get five sigma on that for 50% of the values in 10 years. And if we're super lucky, um, we're, even if delta CP is, even if there is no delta CP, if it's at zero or negative five or two, which are difficult ranges to resolve, we'll be able to um, do a lot of exclusion of those values um, given the power of Dune. It may not be clear. Um, how much power is, or the, the resolving power of this experiment given this chart by itself, but when we go into the, to the events, it'll become more evident, the sort of things you need to do to get this sort of um, exclusionary power and or measurement power um, for this value. It's, it's fairly difficult. 
So one of the ways we're going to do that is through the new the do near detector. Again, we have a whole near detector at Nova, but it's not going to be this guy. This is what I would consider the Swiss Army knives of near detectors for neutrinos, and it's going to be at Fermi Lab. The thing that makes this so robust is that it's going to have a liquid argon TPC, a gaseous argon TPC, and an individual system just for observing neutrino interactions all in one. So to give you some sense of how the, the amount of data this thing is going to take, if, uh, well, not if, when the when we upgrade the beam at Fermi Lab to, I think about, I think it's going to be a 30 to 40% upgrade to 1.2 megawatt beam, where, where now we have 10 to 20,000 events for our entire near detector at NOVA, we're going to get 60 million events just in one type of interaction in one, de in one detector at Duke. So if you look at this chart on the right that looks at elasticity and neutrino energy, elasticity is you can think of um, the, the likelihood of the neutrino breaking up or how much energy goes into that breakup. Um, but if you look at just one bin in this, so the, the most yellow bin, that's going to have 20 to 40 times more events than all of NOVA has right now. So this thing is going to be wild. In addition, we're doing a lot of work to make sure that we can resolve the beam flux. So what that means is we are moving parts of the new detector off axis so we can sample the beam flux at different transverse locations. So we can deconvolve on liquid argon the beam flux from the uh, cross section. This is an expensive project, but it's gonna make sure that we can get normalization to 1%. And we still have the probability, the possibility of getting an upgraded beam, to, uh, an ex upgraded accelerator beam while we're operating. So let's talk about solutions for um, getting hydrogen into DIN. So there are a couple of different ways you can do it. You can put a straw tube tracker in sand, which you can then scatter off the hydrogen in the hydrocarbon that's in the straw tube tracker. And you can do some, some analytical techniques to extract measurements on hydrogen. You can also put methane into the, the gaseous argon near detector. Um, you can also do against an analysis techniques to extract measurements on hydrogen. But I think that we should also build a bubble chamber. I think we should do all of these and build a bubble chamber. So let's see how many events we can get from a bubble chamber. So we can look at the, the liquid argon TPC and estimate the event rate. So we know, uh, let's see, I think per ton, we're going to get 60 million events in the, oh, I'm sorry, per 50 tons, we're going to get 60 million events in the liquid argon TPC given the beam. If we change the interaction nucleus, which will be um, hydrogen, which I believe is 40 times lighter, yeah, than, than argon, um, and we look at the differences in density, we expect that we'll have um, a target mass of around, what is it? Oh, it's per ton. So per ton of hydrogen, we should get about 60,000 events per year, which is again, four to five times more than the total amount of bubble chamber data that we currently have in the energy regime that, that do it in Nova both service. And that's again, per year. So I think we should definitely build a, a five liter prototype and that's somewhat what I'm doing. Let's talk about how bubble chambers work. So there are different styles of bubble chambers. There's something called a dirty design, which is what the old giant 15-foot bubble chambers are like. So I'll describe some of the parts. You have an interior chamber, which is on the right. Um, next to that interior chamber, you have these, these rectangles. Those are actually cross-sections of the, um, and when I say cross-sections, I mean like slices of the uh, magnet that was attached to the bubble chamber. Then you have an outer wall because in order to keep things super cool, hydrogen operates at around 20K. The liquid hydrogen operates at around 20K. You need to basically treat this thing like a thermos. Then you also have cameras on top, which you take a picture of a bubble chamber, uh, of a bubble track through the liquid at a particular time. The way this thing works, it's, it's not always sensitive. In order to make it sensitive, you have to um, compress the liquid. Um, and then once it gets to a compressed state, if you release the pressure on the state uh, on, the, on the liquid in a, in a certain way, you can put the liquid into what's known as a superheated state. 
And then the deposition of um, energy from charged particle tracks gives you bubbles, which you can photograph with your camera. So if you look on the left, this gives you sort of an understanding of the, the, the thermodynamics of how this process works. Um, we can talk about it a little bit later. I don't have time to go into it right now, but this is pretty cool. Wait, what did you mean by I? Oh, I didn't mention that. I forgot. <laughs> so if you if you've ever seen um, what's it called, uh, Hidden Figures, remember uh, the ladies in Hidden Figures were all um, they were called calculators or computers. Mm -hmm. They're called computers. Yeah. So they did the same thing with bubble chambers. So they would take the pictures and then they would give them to literally. They were literally called calculator girls or computer girls. And they would scan the picture for the particle events that we then used, which is, they did a very good job, but it's still imprecise. And this, wow. these are the data we're using to constrain multi-billion dollar experiments now. <laughs> like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, they looked at millions of pictures. I would never. That's a coding thing. Wow. Yeah. Exactly. So not only can we do the experiment, but we can just our analysis will be significantly more precise and will be quicker. Hmm. Probably be automated too. Okay. These are what newer bubble chambers look like. So these styles are made not to look at traditional high energy physics events because bubble chambers used to be used to do high energy physics. These are well, I guess these would still be considered high energy physics. This, this would be considered a dark matter style chamber. The critical thing is when you're looking for dark matter, you're looking for lower energy events, even though in order to access this, this, this dark matter, you could be scanning a range of energies to look for it. Now, the thing about these dark matter chambers, they don't use hydrogen. They use a different working fluid. Um, um, and they also are clean style, which means instead of having an interior chamber that's metal, it's glass, which they call fused silica. And this allows them to operate in, in, in working regimes that are very different from the old style. So not only is this a clean chamber, but it's a slower chamber. So whereas um, cycles on the older bubble chambers took milliseconds, they could cycle probably about one hertz or 10 hertz, I think, at the most. These guys cycle into their sensitive states for hour, for 30 minutes to hours at a time. But because they're operating in a different regime, they're also significantly more precise. So these guys have, this particular style has an acoustic sensor. And to test the acoustic sensors, they put a well-known um, decay or a well-known nucleus that they knew would decay. It's called an isotope. Um, or nuclide um, next to the chamber. And they could hear the different stages of the decay chain just by using the acoustic sensors, which is very precise. It's, I, think it's, I think it's very cool. But then there are upgrades to this. This is from the simulating bubble chamber. This is a prototype where they used a working fluid that was liquid xenon. And not only the liquid xenon can you hear the bubble form, which you can see in the middle graph on the right, but you can see the light from the bubble. So when interaction happens, photons are thrown off. Those photons turn into scintillation photons that you can then absorb with certain detectors. And you could not only get uh, calorimetry from the acoustics of the bubble, but you could get calorimetry from observing the light um, that the bubble emitted. And then you can also trigger on that as well. So this is a very sophisticated chamber and it's very precise. But these are some of the ways that we can do, or some of the new ways that we can do these sorts of chambers as compared to the old style. So one of the ones, these are one of the ones at Fermilab, but this is one of the ones at Fermilab. This is a simulating bubble chamber. Uh, the person who runs this chamber is also working on my project with me. This guy works very similar to the xenon, uh, the prototype xenon chamber you saw before, except instead of using xenon by itself, they're using liquid argon doped with, with liquid xenon because it's cheaper. They have an interior chamber that is also within another pressure vessel. So compared to this style, they have another chamber that is all glass as well as a, a metal chamber. And they have light and they have uh, acoustics. So this thing is super fancy. 
It's designed to achieve live times of about an hour. And they have an entire setup just ready to go and useful. So what I decided to do is take their design, since it's already there, and use some old technology or some old uh, equipment that's lying around Fermilab and try to recreate the older style chambers, knowing what we know now using the current generation of clean style chambers. So that's sort of the plan is literally just to take their design and clear out everything, including the, the glass chamber they have, and try to do an experiment. I'm in the process of doing that right now. Uh, what we want to do is get a fully leak check pressure ready and vacuum ready device. So basically gather all the parts, put it in mini boon hall, start putting things together by the end of this year. So this is where I am on the current status of the design. What you're seeing on the left is, uh, so I did a survey of all the old bubble chambers to see how much cooling power they used and decided to buy a refrigerator that could operate at 20 Kelvin, which I think is negative 200 or I don't have the calculation off the top of my head, but it's very cold. It's much colder than you would think, but it's not as cold as like a quantum computer. But I decided to get a, a refrigerator that's 10 times what I would need because I'm not sure what design challenges we'll encounter. And that's me sort of figuring out what, given what the older chambers used, what sorts or how much cooling power we could get away with. And that's probably about 13, 14 watts. I got a 100 watt system because I want to make sure I don't have to worry about cooling. In the middle, we already have um, the first sketch of, this is a sort of the kindergarten sketch of me working with my engineers, trying to figure out exactly how we want things placed. This is obviously before we get a professional CAD design. So this is just working out exactly how the chamber that we want to build is going to work. Because we have to do some different things because our chamber is going to be smaller. And we're also going to be working with a different fluid. And finally, on the right, we have how the chamber is going to be configured in the pressure, vet, not the pressure, the vacuum jacket that we have elected to use. There's not a lot of space, but we don't have to pay for it. So we're pretty happy about that. These vacuum jackets cost about $200,000 to buy, manufacture, and then certify for use. So we're saving a lot of money. So one of the biggest challenges moving forward with this experiment is that um, it's unclear where to put it. Turns out DOE doesn't want to put hydrogen underground because hydrogen is explosive. If you've ever heard about the Hindenburg, then you know. And the do near detector hall doesn't seem to have a lot of space. So we're currently trying to figure out where we're going to put it. I think we're just going to dig a, dig a giant hole and then just put it in the path of the beam, but outside of the near detector hall for Dune. One of the other things we're thinking about, the reason it's called the MMBC or the modular, modern modular bubble chamber, is that we're trying to make sure it's configurable for all beams. So there's not just a beam or beams at Fermilab. There are two different beams at Fermilab that have different operating structures. And there's also a beam in Japan that we might want to be, that we might want to use. So we're making this as flexible as possible so that we can try to get as many scatterings on hydrogen as possible. If we do what we think we're, we're going to do, this, the data set from this bubble chamber will be the largest anti-neutrino um, and neutrino hydrogen deuterium sample ever made. It would probably eclipse world data in relevant regions by a few orders of magnitude. Um, it's going to resolve tension in current experiments by allowing us to factor the neutrino scattering part from the nuclear physics part. And this is going to be a boon for development in Dune because it helps us constrain what will likely be the largest neutrino scattering data set ever made. So I think if we do this correctly, this will revolutionize the field in terms of neutrino cross-section measurements. In addition to doing work by Dune, there's also really interesting beyond the standard model physics that we can address. So just recently, um, there was a measurement made at Fermi Lab, or a measurement released by the CDF experiment. CDF is the one of the collider experiments on the Tevatron, um, and they released a measurement of W mass that might be one of the most precise measurements ever made, but it is seven sigma away from where the current understanding of that value should be, which indicates there might be some new process in there that we're not understanding that could lead to new physics. Turns out a similar measurement was done with neutrinos in the 80s and 90s by an experiment called NUTEV that one of my mentors worked on. And she also found 
that there's a difference from the W mass from what everybody else thinks it is. And these measurements were also done by CDF along with some of its other competitors. So this might be a way to investigate where that difference is coming from in the W mass. We also can look directly at nucleon structure. So this is using the bubble chamber and neutrino scattering to do nuclear physics and basically observe what's known as nuclear modification. Essentially quarks inside of uh, protons and neutrons behave differently depending upon the size of the nucleus, they, it, depending on the size of the nucleus they're in. So a uh, quark in a uranium atom is much different from a quark in a hydrogen atom. And we're gonna try to map that with a bubble chamber. Previous experiments have tried to do that, but they weren't able to get hydrogen underground. One of the other things that I'm really excited about is that there's a complementarity to an experiment that's coming online called the electron ion collider. This is what you would call a heavy ion experiment, I believe, or it is at least a descendant of heavy ion experiments. And remember how I talked about um, high energy physics wanting to be in high energy because it's much easier to do the math. This experiment will do its best to push that math to the limit in terms of uh, going to lower energies, but it cannot reach the lowest energies where the math that supports HEP falls apart. The experiment that's at Dune will be directly in that region and will be using a probe that is different from all the probes that have been used in that region consistently, which means we'll be able to look at something called the axial vector component and uh, I guess you would call it nuclear current transfers, which means basically we'll be able to probe quark flavor directly which is very, very difficult to do for heavy ion experiments. That's one of the major things we can, can contribute to the electron ion collider. And this sort of bridges the two fields at a very high level. Basically says the HEP um, effort in America and the nuclear physics effort in America, both of these billion dollar collider experiments or particle physics experiments are inherently contradictory. Um, not contradictory, complementary. And the linking thing between these two experiments is a neutrino, our measurements on neutrino, uh, measurements on hydrogen with neutrinos, which a bubble chamber can provide. So in summary, um, we don't have enough cross-section data to do Dune in a way that I would like. And I think the rest of the field recognizes this. I think the next generation provides opportunities for us to do robust cross-section measurements. We just need a new detector to do that. I think that detector is the bubble chamber. And I think if we do that program correctly, we'll, we'll be doing physics that is between both high energy physics and nuclear physics and has interesting implications for both fields. So that's it. Hope you guys enjoyed the talk. Hey, virtual claps. Thank you so much, Brian, for yep. a very interesting, very informative and nice pictures as well. <laughs> um, I'm gonna open it up for questions for other people at this time, because we got like a few minutes left. Um, but I did have a question like first, oh, looks like Alan beat me to it. <laughs> uh, Alan says, oh, I guess you can see the chat now, but he has a question in the chat. What contributions can Lattice lead into the direction? So Lattice has a lot to contribute here. So one of the things that we need to figure out, so there are axial vector and, and vector components to scatterings in, um, in nuclear physics. And unfortunately, you, you can only access the axial vector scattering if you have a neutrino or two um, hadrons that, are, that interact with each other. Problem with if you have two hadrons that interact with each other, you have all this baggage that you're carrying with you. Um, Neutrinos are a light probe that you can poke at certain parts of the nucleus with. And it turns out that you can sort of verify some of those poke, some of the, the ways you poke the nucleus with lattice QCD. In fact, I've been talking with a couple of folks in lattice to try to figure out what sorts of measurements um, would be useful for them developing um, lattice QCD techniques. They need particular numbers that they cannot that you can't just make up that need to be contributed from actual measurement to proceed. And I think we are one of the few experiments that can um, supply that. Oh, hey, Farah. 
Um, other than location, what is the biggest challenge you currently face with this bubble chamber? Also, just out of curiosity, what Monte Carlo generated do you use for your studies? Um, I mean, that's really the biggest problem is 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 location, right? Like, it's pretty dangerous, but that kind of goes with location. When I say dangerous, I mean we have to make every effort we can to make sure that the hydrogen isn't put into a position where it can explode. That means we either have to maintain mixes with oxygen where, or with, with air, where hydrogen is either less than 4% or greater than 72% of the mixture. And if it's anywhere in between that region, any sort of spark can set it off. So that's one of the major things you have to worry about. But I mean, safety is also a big part of this project. As for money collar generators, um, I mean, we'll probably use what's standard, Cheney, Achille, New, Neuro. Um, we're at lower energies where I think um, the neutrino generators will probably be useful. I mean, but part of Genie and the regular neutrino generators are also Pythia. And in fact, we're still using Pythia 6, which is kind of embarrassing, but you know, it is what it is. Um, Nate, could you elaborate on why you want to use LH2 as a target material? Will you have to purify the LH2 to, cert to be certain to make a good measurement? Also, will you be, be able to disentangle interaction with hydrogen versus deuterium? Yeah, so the reason we want to use hydrogen is because it's the simple, it's the most simple nucleus we can possibly use, right? So we're getting access to all of these initial scattering uh, processes without having to deal too much with the nuclear physics here. We're dealing with the minimum amount of nuclear physics. So that way we can sort of say, well, this is the base way these things interact and then sort of build the nuclear physics part on top by putting heavier nuclei into the bubble chamber and looking at how the size of the nucleus affects the scattering that we get. Um, will I have to purify liquid hydrogen? No, um, the liquid hydrogen comes from, we're gonna order it from probably air gas. It comes research grade or ultra high precision, ultra high measurement grade. So all we have to do is just maintain the purification. And um, yes, we will be able to disentangle interactions from hydrogen on deuterium. We can order hydrogen that does not have much deuterium in it. We can also order deuterium. And doing the measurements on both of these things not only gives us a really interesting understanding of what happens as you go from one nuclei or one nucleus to two, right? Or the two nucleons, excuse me. So go from one nucleon to two nucleons. But if you assume that up and down quarks sort of behave the same, it gives you a really good measurement of some of the critical things like this axial vector component that only neutrinos can, can measure. So I hope that answers your question, Nate. Okay, um, any other questions? Yeah, I think we have time for one more maybe. If anybody wants mm -hmm. to go before me. Well, um, I guess my question was about more like, because you showed this timeline of your project, right? So lately yeah. I've been getting very interested in project design and inception and management and stuff. So I'm a little, I, I'm curious if you could elaborate, like as an associate scientist, is that your title? Yeah. Like how does how does project design work at Fermi Lab or like national labs and what is what is the timeline, the accessibility, the cost, things like that? Like how do you make a project? So the timeline was set by the the uh by the constraints of the funding. So I'm only allowed 36 months to get this done. And that's because I'm using what's known as a Fermi Lab LDRD. The amount of money they gave me was 860,000 to build this project. So this has to be at least more than halfway done. I'm, th I'm thinking, I'm th yeah, at least halfway done in order for me to say it's successful. I mean, it really is a difficult thing to resurrect an old technology, mm. right? So you can consider this, when we were building bubble chambers, we were also sending people to the moon on like the Apollo spaceships, right? No. Or the Apollo rocket, uh, the Apollo program, sorry. And that, that would be the Saturn, the Saturn rocket, right? So in the time that we've sent people to the moon, those folks at NASA have retired. And the ways to make that rocket and actually send people to the moon has, has, has been lost with them, right? 
Mm -hmm. We're encountering the same problem with bubble chambers. So it's literally like building this is kind of like trying to send people to the moon again. That's the level of technology that we're, <laughs> that we're working on. I know it seems kind of like an outrageous comparison, but it really is. We were doing particle physics back then that I don't think we can do anymore right now. So this is a, an attempt to try to build this project again and try to basically, instead of building a Saturn V rocket from scratch, because we already did it, you build a tiny one first and see how far you can get. Right. So what do you do if like your prototype exceeds the cost? Um, then I have to find more funding. But I mean, you work very hard to make sure your prototype doesn't exceed the cost. Work very hard. So is like the funding system like similar to a university or is this like through all through a Fermilab like system? So my LDRD is all through Fermilab, but the we have the same funding constraints as university professors. We are in fact almost the same. Oh. The only difference is at a national laboratory, we have an allocation from DOE that happens every year. Interesting. Yep. It's never something I thought to ask, but since you're here. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, in that case, uh, I think we're one minute past the end of the time. So I'm going to go ahead and close it out. But thank you again so much, Brian, for coming and sharing your work and your research and your plans. Um, wishing you the best of luck with rebuilding the Apollo program. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right. So that's all we have for today's seminar. Thank you, everybody, for logging on. If you're watching this recording, thank you for tuning in. And we'll see you next month.